Good morning and welcome to the Superintendent Community Update live with Lutz for Friday, March 19th. Happy Friday. Sun and shining after a day of rain um, and, of course, cold weather this morning. My first shout out uh, due to the rain and, and, of course, black eyes. We had a handful of students, uh, high school students involved in an accident this morning on, on Brentwood Road, black ice. All the kids are fine. Cars, not so much. Uh, but thoughts and prayers first uh, go out to the children that uh, th that were involved. Uh, I know it adds stress. I know with two daughters and, and a few fender benders uh, with them. Uh, myself, uh, I know I can just imagine what uh, parents and kids are going through today. Most important thing is everyone's okay. Uh, the rest will take care of itself. <laughs> and I do speak from several opportunities of experience. Um, Shout out to today also goes to the school level bill, uh, uh, administration, the principals, assistant principals, and, uh, car, uh, and the teachers. Uh, as, we, as you've heard me talk about, uh, staying open for children for in-person learning is sometimes is, is very much a balancing act, and today probably is, is one of those uh, greatest times. Uh, we had 35 unfilled positions today, mainly teachers. Uh, we know that we've been going through the um, uh, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, and there's been uh, some pretty significant uh, day after effects where folks have not been uh, feeling well. Uh, that's part of that, that's a main part of it. Uh, so we have some teachers, some paraprofessionals, uh, custodians, some other category of, uh, of people. But many of the positions that are unfilled today, those 35, are unfilled when they need normally to have a substitute in there. Again, whether it's a substitute custodian substitute secretary, substitute para, or ultimately a substitute uh, teacher. So it's a puzzle. Uh, I know for my 10 years of being in a school building, um, that was a task every single morning that I dreaded. I got, got pretty good at it, but I dreaded uh, fitting those pieces together and, and making that puzzle, making that puzzle work. Uh, so thank you to the administrators that create the plan. Thank you to the staff uh, that are in attendance that are making the plan work. Uh, because it is a challenge. Uh, just because we're open doesn't necessarily mean that we should take it for granted of all the pieces and parts that it takes to stay open. Last week we talked about the transportation department and the number of absences that we had there related to COVID uh, and just the ability to stay open there. I made a comment last week that, that we were concerned about um, filling the runs but able to be able to be able to fill runs safely. And what I meant by that is, is some of our support personnel, uh, the garage is comprised of more than just drivers. Uh, it's comprised we have our own mechanic crew we have our own uh, bus cleaners bus washers that um, that help keep buses safe as well I mean mechanics are doing the larger repairs but the, the bus cleaners and bus washers help keep buses safe as well and doing some of the minor things as well as just what their title call is called for uh, washing and cleaning uh, but it's it's more than that it's fueling buses it's it's making sure that they're safe for running and so when those folks aren't able to be at work then then we do run into a challenge of making sure that our fleet remains safe. Uh, and so it's more than just putting a bus behind, or um, excuse, excuse me, a driver behind the wheel of a bus. It's about all the pieces and parts of running a safe operation. And so uh, shout out to Dave and to Ed over there that have been able to continue to make that process work. Uh, Sue and Lisa, uh, you're, really the, you're really the ones making it work. Ed, Ed and Dave just take all the credit, but Sue and Lisa, you're the ones that are you're, you're, you're really the, the engine behind that machine. Um, next, a shout out. I had a conversation, uh, opportunity to have a conversation this week uh, with the Grable Foundation and, and three faces of, of that group. Uh, the, the director, Greg Bear, uh, just a fantastic person, uh, and, and two former superintendents that, that are there as fellows, uh, Dr. Bart Rocco and Dr. Billy Rondinelli. Um, the reason for the shout out is it, as, as schools are struggling this year just to, to maintain some sense of normalcy and, and move forward with um, whatever this past year has has been good bad or indifferent uh, they help us keep an eye on what could be and what should be what parts of 2020 and, and the pandemic need to be left behind what parts should we be celebrating what parts have allowed us to think differently uh, and, I, and i've said this this week probably too many times for the folks that are in, in my uh, circle and, and the conversations you know, I love watching History Channel. Judy doesn't so much, but um, I love watching those types of shows and, and uh, the series that's on now. You know, different industries that that uh, build America, whether it's the chocolate industry, car industry, and anything in between, and the people that build America. 
And I'm convinced that every industry has had their opportunity for that transfer transformative time, that opportunity, that, that, that transformation was in front of them. And some of the industry seized it and some didn't. Uh, and some that, that, that failed to seize it in their place now, like in Homestead, there's a, a Lowe's home improvement store where the mill used to be. But other other industries that seized those opportunities have flourished, developed to, to so many in so many different ways. I believe that for schools, our transformational time is right now. And so how will we choose to seize this opportunity that what we did before COVID and what we do after COVID really will make a difference. And I'll give you a, a quick story. We have a policy in the school district that in order for a parent to visit a classroom, they had to have prior communication with the principal, make an appointment with the teacher, give prior notice. Um, and, and, and there were only so many limits, so, so many visits allowed to happen per nine week period. It was all outlined very explicitly in, in a policy of procedure. I'm sure every school district had something that looked the same. On any given day now, there could be 12, 15, 20 teachers, I'm excuse, parents involved in a lesson, listening to a lesson, sitting next to their child, overhearing the conversation between the teacher and the children in class and the, their child sitting there at the dining room table or the, the desk in the office or wherever that happens to be. So that policy that we were so concerned about a year ago or 15 months ago, that any time a visitor would have to come into the building or a parent to visit a classroom, we had to make sure that we checked all these boxes. And simply now we, we don't worry about those. Yes, we are concerned that the folks make sure that, that, that information does not get posted and, and we're violating children's rights of privacy. And But the things that we focus on now are not the things that we focused on a year ago. Uh, a little over a year ago, we, we were trying to figure out how to organize our five flexible instructional days that we were allotted from the state to respond to weather emergencies. And we were convinced we couldn't do it with with the organizations and the structures that we had in place. But yet, little did we know what was very close in, in front of us and what we had to respond to. So thank you to uh, Greg Bear, to Bart, to Billy, to, for helping us to remain focused on on what needs to come and, and how we can respond. They are advocates for children, learning, and, and just the process that schools engage in every day. And so thank you to, to those three outstanding people. Our COVID updates and uh, just community updates, let's talk a little bit about these. Uh, for Baldwin Borough, I know actually all three boroughs, the two boroughs in township last week, numbers were, were very, very low. And I think that part of that was attributed to the county switching the, the reporting system and, and some of their uh, charts and graphs. Numbers have rebounded this week about to the level which they were prior to last week. Last week we were in single digits, 4%, 2%, 1% uh, respectively. Uh, this week we've, we, we have rebounded. Baldwin Borough, 26%, uh, 38 cases out of 147 tests. Whitehall Borough, 20 new cases out of 93 tests, 22% positivity. Baldwin Township, 57% uh, positive. They had eight new cases, 14 tests. I know the number is quite small, but uh, the, number, the, the ratio and the positivity rate uh, being quite quite high. Um, all that information is available, again, on the link that I'll provide for you as part of the notes that get emailed out after each of these sessions. Uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Health dashboard, relatively unchanged. And, and just a point of note, if you do look on there, the numbers that we get about midday on Friday and that are, 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 are whatever they are. Uh, but when I look again <laughs> the next week, they change slightly. So um, our case count went down 39, so relatively unchanged, uh, but 1,130 down to 1,091. The incident rate, remember, we always need that to, to stay below 100. So it, it fell slightly from 92.9 to 89.7. So really unchanged. And the positivity rate, just a, just a couple tenths up, 5.2 to 5.4. So uh, overall numbers across the county as reported by the state and the numbers that, that I've given from the local level with those Baldwin, Township Baldwin Borough and Whitehall Borough numbers uh, are, are, are about level. Where we do have some concern 
are the number of cases that are happening in school. And so Allegheny County Health Department did a presentation as they do every Thursday to the superintendents. And the, the report yesterday, I mean, we're only about halfway through March. Uh, the number of cases in March uh, do look to exceed where we were in February. And February was the highest month so far at 605 total cases uh, for, within, the, uh, within schools, uh, 380 so far in March. Um, the number of cases uh, K-12 among students is high. Uh, and when I look at uh, total cases and proportionality of, of what's happening in schools. And so it's been running uh, like in November, about 4% of the overall cases across the county were related to schools. That fell in December, probably because most schools were remote, but it fell in December to just a little bit about 1%. January started to rebound a little bit, but again, most schools were in a hybrid, I'm sorry, were in a remote setting. So only about 2.3% in, in January. It grew to 8.3% in February. And now in March, we're just a, a hundredth of a percent under 10%. And so the number of cases in schools are growing. Where are the cases in schools? It, for the longest time, uh, October, November, December, um, and even in January, the number of cases were much higher in adults. We've seen that start to tail off. Now, is that related to the vaccine uh, availability maybe? Uh, so the adult cases um, have decreased. The number of cases for uh, for the group of 13 to 18 year olds significantly higher. In, Feb in February, it nearly doubled where it was in January. March so far uh, is, is is nearly half of what it was. Actually, actually, better than half of what it was in February. We're not done with March by a long shot. Ages 5 to 12, the same thing. A much higher percentage and number of cases for five to 12 year olds, which are basically our elementary age children, and our 13 to 18 year olds, which are our secondary age students. So adult cases on the decline, but student cases definitely on the incline. And we're seeing that within Baltimore Whitehall. We're seeing that every single day. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as it relates to even sports and, and our masking requirements. CDC is looking to change their guidelines. So even on the news this morning, nothing has come out yet, but uh, pretty pretty sure that sometime today on Friday, that the CDC will change their guidelines for so, uh, social distancing or physical distancing from from six feet uh, to three feet of space. And people have asked, well, how will this change things? The, the challenge is, is that we're working with several agencies, and the agencies it's kind of like when we were kids. You get an answer. We don't like that answer from dad. We go and ask mom. We don't I like that answer from mom. Maybe we go ask grandma. Well, in my world, grandma Lutz being next door, usually didn't ask grandma Lutz. Grandma Lutz was tougher than mom and dad. So so we usually didn't ask grandma Lutz. Now, if grandma Matthews was, was, was around the house, we'd ask her. She was a pushover. But um, these agencies kind of operate in the same way. Uh, one guidance is different than the next guidance, is different than the next one, different than the next one. And, and schools have been left to try to balance that. What we know now, or what we believe, that we know now is that CDC will be coming out today and saying that scientific studies, mostly in the state of Massachusetts, uh, have looked at the the efficiency and the efficacies of three feet of space compared to six feet of space and what that contagious, uh, what was the impact on contagiousness of the virus. Um, and they're saying that there's really no difference. Where it makes, where this would apply is in situations only when masks can still be worn. So of course the classroom, the hallways, the buses. Um, buses we know that we, we've we been tighter than, than some of the space. And so maybe our, our study, if we did a scientific study of our buses, maybe we could support this as well. In many of our classrooms, the space is, the, the space is not our restriction. Yes, it, there are many at the high school level where we're sitting at four and five feet front to back, side to side, we're five and six feet. So we're not at three, uh, but we're not at six either. Elementary, maybe we're in better shape. Where we are really struggling with, where we where we would not have a mask, cafeterias. That's not negotiable. Having a child not wear a mask in a cafeteria and be under six feet is not recommended. And really, it's not negotiable as far as what I'm looking at. Uh, so we are challenging ourselves to look at all of these spaces. Uh, and what 
what this does look like or what we should expect coming from the CDC as early as this morning, as late as this afternoon. But we, we do expect that to change. Allegheny County Health Department yesterday in the call was asked about this. So, okay, CDC is going to say now three feet. What's your stance? The stance from the County Health Department is that contact tracing will still occur at the six foot mark. So what does this mean? So in classrooms, kids may be as close as three feet. When there's a positive case, because there will be, the studies show it, our data shows that cases are on the increase with students. So when the case occurs, basically more children will be quarantined. So three feet of distancing will allow us to get more children back. And we're gonna talk about that return to school and that waitlisted uh, uh, process that we have right now. But we could, maybe we can open up the doors for anyone who wants to come back. Um, we're looking at that, cafeteria, busing, so forth. But, but when a case comes through the door, basically get out your measuring your, your measuring tape which of course you know I don't leave home without one uh, get out your measuring tape and go into the classroom and figure out that six foot radius draw draw your circle and anyone that's inside that circle spends 10 days at home um, I know some schools are doing that already we, we've been uh, very purposeful in our contact tracing but if we're three feet of distance and cases are coming through the door do we get just simply more matter of fact and and create our create our circles or create our zone, so to speak, and, and anyone inside that space would, would then be quarantined. I think it is good news that if we can get more children back into the school, uh, we know the children are struggling. We know the social, emotional, academic. I did a piece this week with uh, Chris Lovingood on WTAE. He had called and asked if, if I'd be willing to, to talk about where we're at with learning loss or, or learning gaps or learning pace, call it what you like. Uh, but we know that learning this year is different. We, the, the pacing is different than the amount of content that the teachers are able to, to teach and to share with children. I don't like the word cover. Cover cover seems like something you do with a sheet and a table um, or a bed. But um, but how much are able are we able to teach? And, and it is different. So what does this look like for this year, for this summer, for next year? Um, and so we do believe that the best place for children is in school, largely for most children. So um, this this ruling will allow more kids to be in school, but it may increase the number of children that are quarantined in any given any given time. So the wait listed process that we have. So since we've been coming back to school four days, we knew that we were capped out based upon the current criteria. We've had a wait list created for children, um, and so we're proceeding forward with our plan. Uh, regardless of the CDC guidelines. And, and, and if the CDC does adjust, then, then we'll adjust. We'll look at a phase two. Uh, but right now, we are looking at children that have been on that wait list that have signed up. Uh, and, and I've pushed that out to everybody uh, in the past. Uh, there, there will be a time that I, I push that out once again, but not right at this moment. But if you're on the wait list prior to March 1st, then that's the first group that we're addressing. We've reviewed classrooms and we feel really good about classroom space. Uh, we've been looking at buses and we're concerned there. As I said, we're concerned about cafeterias. Uh, we won't let those things hold us back, but it may change how we get kids to and from school. It may change what a cafeteria or lunchtime looks like. Those are our pinch points and those, those are areas that we need to continue looking at. Um, I have a list from all the schools that was presented to me yesterday. Um, we are looking at an April 6th uh, return, which is the first day of the fourth nine weeks for this group. Uh, the, the list, again, have been created for me. I've, been, I've reviewed them. Uh, we are going to get letters out from the school at the school level. They should happen within the next week. We have right now about 40 children, grades K to six, across um, all three of those buildings: McInerney, Harrison, and Whitehall. We have about 50 children, grades seven through 12. Um, so, so just short of about of about 100 children that we will, will uh, be our first wave, or our first phase, and then we'll look at phase two once we uh, once we can assess the, the success of where we are now. I want to move forward with attendance confusion and, and a, a attendance concerns. Um, and this week has been one of, of several concerns that have been voiced by, by folks. Um, and, and thank you for putting that question on uh, the, the q and A. I I know, it, I, I believe it's been a, a great subject of conversation on social media. Um, but if it, if it only remains on a social media platform, then it really is not 
I don't think it's really moving forward to a solution or at least to getting answers by pushing it out to me and the vehicles that, that I've, I've tried to communicate through. Um, that helps us get our communication or at least some answers. Whether we like the answers or not, it's okay. Uh, but at least some answers a little a little closer to to, um, to where people can understand it. Attendance this year is a challenge. There's no doubt. We have a process in place. Is it the best? No, it is not the best. Is it the worst? No, I don't think it's the worst either. But we are required to measure student daily attendance. Now, in-person attendance is pretty easy. We should be using standard attendance policies and procedures when kids are in school. But when they're in, in remote learning, LEAs, which is the local educational agency, Baldwin Whitehall is an LEA, LEAs must develop and employ a procedure within the current attendance system to make daily contact and participation, and performance and contact, it's two-pronged to, to make that um, part, of, uh, part of our process. So when students are learning remotely, regardless of whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, the attendance measurement must include data that allows the schools to assess whether the student engaged in a assigned learning activity. Capturing a log on or contact with the school staff is just simply not enough to truly assess exposure to the learning. So it's access and it's completions. It's two prong. So schools have different ways that they can measure access. Do they have access to, to, to the materials? Uh, that could be, did the child or parent come and pick up the learning materials from the school, the school that particular day or that week? So did they pick up the learning packet? There are some schools that are not one-to-one. -one. They don't have uh, internet cap capabilities within the community. So they are very much relying upon packets. Um, and so if children are picking up the packets, then they had access. Did they complete the packets? That's the completion. So in our particular district, one of the ways that we have, have chosen to measure access is the completion of a daily online form that indicates such. Um, as a district, we, it's been my decision, and, and I think I've said that here before, and I've been criticized for it, and that's okay, I'll take the criticism. Um, we've opened up that form to, to be open 15 hours a day. There are some districts I know that, are, that touch our border that have that form. They, they use the same form, Google, where parents basically have a 45-minute window to complete to, to, in order to check off that their child um, will be accessing the learning for that particular day, a 45-minute window, an hour or so forth. Um, we open it up early in the morning and it stays open till late at night. I think it's open till 11 p.m. at night. So parents have the ability if it, if it comes to the parent or if the child can do it. So if they can log on first thing in the morning and, and mark off access. They can, they can log on late at night before they go to bed and indicate that access was gained. The second piece has to be the completion. And completion is evidence that the student completed the assigned learning activities. Um, so tracking participation and embedding a word of the day. Um, and this is a challenge because we know that some children are learning asynchronously. They are not logging on in person. So they may be doing all of their assignments on the weekend because parents may be busy during the week. They don't have opportunity for, for the children to engage uh, synchronously during the week with the teacher. So they're getting everything done on a weekend and turning it in by the, the, the um, communicated deadlines. So where this really breaks down is it sounds so simple, but in, in process, it is very difficult. So let's play this out. So what determines either being present or absent? So if you confirm that you had access, you check off the Google sheet, yes. You turn in your assignments in a timely manner, yes and yes. Present, perfect. If you didn't complete your access, the Google Sheet, but timely submission of the assignment. The state says, as an example, that that should be a yes. But how do you track it? What if you assign? What if you in elementary is maybe it's a little bit easier because you have a homeroom structure. One teacher, maybe two teachers, if, if they if, if they share, if they if they do the pl uh, platooning. But what if the child submits their assignments in in, in in seventh grade in social studies and science? did not submit an ELA, math, world languages, how do, you, how do you mark present for that day? Because they submitted half, but not the other half. Next one, 
evidence of access. So they confirmed access, they checked the box. They didn't do any work. Now this happens every day. Kids show up in the high school, they show up at the elementary school. They're there, their body is in that building. They don't do anything all day long. Those kids are considered present. They came to school. They didn't do it and they may be failing everything. They're present. But if you're a remote child, if you show up on the Google form, don't do any work all day long, all week long, you're considered absent. But your in-person counterpart can do nearly the same thing, but just have their body in a seat all week, and they were present. That's what makes this really confusing. Or if there is no access, no submission, then you're absent. Let me spin this back around. Let's assume that a child checked off access all week long. The assignments were due that week by Sunday. No assignments were, were turned in. Were they absent for one day or for five days? And those are the things, those are the questions that on the face of this, oh, well, geez, attendance is so easy. Check the box. Have the teacher mark whether they're present or not. Uh, again, at the elementary level, whether you're a teacher with 25 kids or, or 50 kids because you're sharing uh, with across a couple of homerooms, maybe that's a little bit easier. If I'm a high school teacher with 150 children that I see on, on, a, on a given day, how do I keep track of them? So the criticism that may be out there is that, that, that the, the parent or the child bears no responsibility in the attendance. I won't accept because right now it is a challenging, challenging task to figure out what attendance looks like. Mrs. Salafek and I argued, was, I would say, yeah, it was an argument. Um, we argued for about an hour yesterday. And Mrs. Salafek, a, she's a pretty seasoned debater. Um, but, you know, what is attendance? What counts as attendance as we move forward this year and, and next year? Is attendance time and seat? or is it completion of activities, completion of the work? And that's a great question. For 100 years and more, attendance simply was go to school, sit there for 45 minutes, eight times, and you were, you, you were never being questioned for attendance. You may not do a darn thing all day long, all year, all year long, but you were still in attendance. But again, is that something that is a positive coming out of COVID or a negative? I think it's a positive. I think time and seat is a very poor way to figure out whether a child attended school or not. It's very, very poor. So, of course, much more to come, but the challenge that we have, and maybe this is where some of the aggravation has come this week with, with some of the letters that have come out, um, we are still required to compute attendance in an archaic manner, but yet the real life practices are just so different. And we're trying to make it work this year. It, it, it's, it's, it's not the best. But I can guarantee you from what I've heard and seen from other schools and districts, it's definitely not the worst. Um, I've been really trying to be re receptive and responsive to parents' needs around work schedules and so forth. So leaving that attendance window to be completed over a course of like 15 hours, to me, is, is a responsive thing. An hour in the morning, or and if you don't fill it out, now your child's absent, and now you're fighting that fight. We've not accepted that, and we've pushed back at every stance. Uh, another point of, of conversation uh, this week, winter sports and masking. And the idea, some of our sports are over, basketball. Uh, the, the children had uh, participated in playoffs and were not successful um, and, and ultimately lost the game. But we've been, implemented a plan that, that calls for a 10-day quarantine period after the final competition, whether it's a game, match, meet, whatever whatever it might be. Uh, and the reason reason being, and, and folks have asked, well, what's the scientific data on that? Why, why are we enforcing that type of, of protocol? Um, in basketball, it, it may be a little, little more straightforward and simple. You know, all, all year long, we were requiring a mask to be worn. On the sidelines, during the games, and yes, that was a point of controversy and, and, and pushback. Playoffs, we couldn't, we could not um, hold to that because we, we would not we weren't in charge of uh, who we played. So we could be playing a masked team or an unmasked team. Um, we know now, again, this, this uh, statistics I gave a little bit earlier, 
the student to student cases are, are, are growing significantly across the county. Um, and so taking some preventative measures with sports teams where they may be exposed and bringing the virus into the into the building is a concern. Um, people say, that, well, what about the hockey team? Hockey team participates all year long. That they've not been wearing masks. Um, the hockey team's also been shut down, I believe, on three different occasions this year. And now we're heading into the playoffs uh, for that particular squad. And in lost games prior to this, I know the team's doing very, very well. I think I saw 15-1. And one was what I saw this morning in the paper. Um, but as we head into the playoffs, a lost game or a, a quarantine period really could mean the end of the season. And so the the idea of, of beginning a quarantine period because of playoffs or, or due to the engagement of playoffs, I think has a twofold approach. Number one, yes, the team can be exposed on any given day in, in the rink to another team because of someone else. And that may cause a shutdown of the team. But we are having more and more cases in the school as well. And on any given day, we may be quarantining because of school exposure. So by having a quarantine period in place now, does that act actually preserve the opportunity for the children to not lose out as they did last year? And I think that, that the T-shirt that was made for me was, you know, basically undefeated. The only difficult way the season last year was COVID. I still have that shirt. Um, but this year, let's 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 make sure that we're not doing some things that take away that opportunity again. And so, if this quarantine period, again, because of case counts for children that that are increasing for a variety of reasons, have made it more difficult to remain open. Uh, we know that children have been exposed and continue to be exposed. Uh, across different sports, um, and I'm hearing it from other superintendents, youth baseball, youth basketball, um, hockey, um, across the county, these are the areas that, that the most concern is happening and the most cases are coming out. So the, the statistics are real. Quarantines are happening because of the involvement in sports. I'm not saying don't be involved. We just have to need to know and understand what the risks are and respond accordingly to try to prevent what we can so uh, we we will we have we have written the masking into our health and safety plan it's been approved by the board it's been submitted to the state uh, and we will remain consistent with that so um, the cheerleading team will will be um, quarantined when they get back uh, they're, they're doing some some uh, state level competition uh, wrestling been do, uh, wrestling uh, gymnastics basketball boys and girls and then um, hockey will do the same and the positive and the benefit is that we want the kids to be successful uh, on the rink, on the court, uh, on the mat, and, and in the classroom. Let's talk just for a minute for planning for next year. And, and most of today has been really responding to cases of COVID this week, and it, boy, it's not, not a great update. Uh, but planning for next school year, we need to start thinking about that. Here we are in March. It's March 19th. Um, I'm just going to present just, just a concept. Meaningful learning anytime, anywhere. Meaningful learning, anytime, anywhere. What does this really mean? And how do we get there? We know that maybe because of necessity or out of choice, about 20% of our population have chosen the remote learning option. If they didn't have to, would they remain in that, in that manner? Does five days a week, 45 minutes a day, a period um, or six hours and 45 minutes for the whole day does that constitute learning just because you came and sat you know where they say your, your your mind can absorb what your your backside can endure is that the philosophy that we should be looking at does a child need to come to school five days a week if they are at grade level achieving a satisfactory or above level and within a classroom um, could there be combinations of in-person and remote learning experiences in any particular class, more at the older level, you know, the idea of reinventing high schools? So what does this mean, meaningful learning anytime, anywhere? And, and that's the conversation I wish to engage in as we move into next year's planning and we start to develop master schedules. We've already looked at some just some days in the calendar next year that we don't have to restrict learning opportunities or being closed, like election day. 
we don't want to be in person if voting's happening in our buildings. It's a safety security issue. But we don't have to miss the day of school. We can continue to proceed. We can make it a remote learning day, synchronous or asynchronous. And that provides flexibility in our calendar. But how do we go beyond that? And how far beyond that should we go? These are the conversations that I want to engage in with administration, with teachers, with parents, and with children. And to start to develop, is this our transformational time? Is this a time where, where we can rethink how and what we do around education for the good of, of what really could be our next generation? So more to come on that. The idea, again, meaningful learning anytime and anywhere. Okay, Q&A for today. A couple, two, two left over from last week. Special Olympics. There was a question whether we're going to have Special Olympics this year. I really some sad news. Um, we're not. Uh, you think about the children that participate in, in Special Olympics. They, they are your, your uh, children at one of the highest levels of risk. And to have those children all together uh, with the adults that it takes to, to pull off that event and, and the proximity, um, it really is a high-risk endeavor. Uh, it really could be life or death for, for the children. So um, while it's a beautiful thing, so many, so many generations of Baldwin, Whitehall, community members, students, teachers have participated in that. Um, this is just not the right time. Uh, and Special Olympics is taking a st step back. Um, it's not a decision that we said, hey, with this, this, the school is not available. It's really a philosophical decision and one that we support as well. Uh, senior prom. We're looking at trying to make the school year as normal as possible. I know that's almost an oxymor oxymoron normal in, in this time. Uh, but the, the development, especially with the indoor limits being being adjusted by the governor, we are looking at planning around senior prom. Uh, but we're also making decisions as to who's eligible uh, and, and the idea of, of visitors because anyone who is a current student is just that, a student. Anyone who's not a current student is a visitor. And what does that mean for eligibility? Um, I have great concern over having any visitors come into any of our schools at this point or any of our events senior prom being one of those. So if, while a final decision has not been made, um, we are definitely looking at having the senior prom being that of only, uh, for eligibility for only current high school children. So seniors, or of course we know that sometimes underclassmen are invited, but have to be invited at the, as the guest uh, or the date of a senior. The question around parking, the parking use or, or increasing parking spaces and using the bus lot uh, to do that because uh, people are correct. Largely, the, the south parking lot or the pool parking lot of Baldwin High School sits largely un unused during the day. Uh, teachers park around the perimeter. Uh, we do have some uh, drop off and pick up from our, our student uh, our student preschool program during the course of the day. Uh, some visitors parking down there um, who are picking children up from those programs. Um, but Largely, the center of that parking lot does stay open during the course of the day, uh, but it is desperately needed for uh, four periods uh, of, of the school day. The high school arrival, the middle school arrival, and then the high school departure, the middle, middle, middle school departure. Um, we cannot park buses anywhere else. I mean, just the idea of looping the 72-passenger uh, the, the vehicle in and out of, of a space. Um, the, rest of that, the rest of that area is congested, as we know. And it is a limit. There are limitations. There are limitations of what we can do uh, for student parking, but the majority of our children are riding the school buses um, to a great, a great majority. Um, and so we have to continue to, to use that parking lot for those spaces. And, and while we've looked at everything up there, um, this is an area that we, we should not and will not be making any changes to. There are questions on the list about waitlisting of the, the waitlisted uh, children. I think I've answered those. Um, there are questions around the CDC guidelines six feet to three feet. I think I've answered those as well. Uh, the question specifically from Mr. Myers around um, how that has to filter through state and county. Um, and it's going to take a little bit of interpretation. And I think I've shared that a little bit as well. Uh, but you know, we are looking and proceeding. We're not waiting for an answer. We're planning as a what would three foot three foot of distance look like? How do we make it work? Um, the transportation app seems to be having a problem. I, it's the second comment I've had about that, uh, that there, there must have been an up, update somewhere around March 15th. Uh, let me check it out. Thank you for that. Uh, 
a question around the, the playoffs and scientific reason for the athletes participating uh, or being restricted during the playoffs. Um, I think we talked about that. Uh, parents and, and attendance of children, we talked about that. Senior prom, check. Uh, the commitment form. So once we get phase one of, of the children back in, we will look at uh, revising and revisiting the commitment, commitment form to see who else, uh, again, based upon the six feet to three feet, where we stand with any other child who wants to come back in. Uh, positioning the school, the buses, uh, and more wait list questions. So I think we've got those covered. So th thank you and continue to push those questions out to me. And even that link will stay active all week long. And anything that comes in after today, um, I will include either in the notes of what I present uh, or I will just answer during the Q&A section. Quotes and reminders for today. Um, and I think the, 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 the topic for today really fits on the idea of patience. And as the weather gets nice, the sun is shining, the weather starting to get, the temperature starting to get warmer, um, we are just growing so tired of some of the limitations that we all are, are, are enduring. Um, but I think the idea of patience is really critical at this time. Um, and a couple quotes, some, some of them may be a little humorous, um, but, but uh, important nonetheless. Um, from Mac McCleary, patience is something that you admire in the driver behind you and scorn in the one ahead of you. Uh, so true. Um, the next one, patience is power. Patience is not an absence of action. Rather, it is, it is timing. It waits on the right time to act for the right principles and in the right way from Fulton Sheen. This next one, of course, in a society that everything is instantaneous, how can a society that exists on instant mashed potatoes, packaged cake mixes, frozen dinners, and instant cameras teach patience to its young? Paul Sweeney. Great question, Paul, um, but important nonetheless. And I think that you think about patience and how, how patience plays out in our own lives and our, in our own way. Um, in my world, Patience is very important. It's been two years uh, that that we've been patient, Judy and I, uh, watching and 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 probably tears, uh, waiting for Jenna to uh, to engage in basketball, the game that she loves again. Uh, so it took two two years for her to find the floor. The last real game that she has played in uh, was in Atlanta in, a, in an AAU tournament a couple of years ago. Uh, injuries and of course other factors that contributed to her not being. Um, able to play or or called upon to play over the last couple of years. Um, and today is it, due to an adjusted schedule with COVID, Allegheny's first game. And uh, very excited to watch her play remote, you know, watching on uh, watching on the stream. And uh, it looks very promising that the little girl may start. So I'm really excited for Jenna, excited for all the work that she has put in along the way. And so patience, uh, we always say patience is a virtue. Well, it is in so many different ways. So please remember, six feet, maybe three feet, but six feet for today, three feet maybe tomorrow, uh, masking, grace, and um, let's just continue to get through this all together. Thank you so much.